Hello everyone, my name is Joel Azrael. I'm a recruitment consultant and headhunter based in Hong Kong, focusing on recruiting in the digital, data, and analytics space. I also host a series called Career Stories, where I interview people from different professions to learn more about their career journeys and how they came to be who they are today. So today we are speaking with Kumar Vimuri, a senior executive with over two decades of work experience in finance and technology. He has worked with companies like Lucent Technologies, Bell Labs Innovations, Deutsche Asset and Wealth Management, RBC Capital Markets, and Singapore's Sovereign Wealth Fund, and with a couple of startups as well. Over the course of his career, he has worked in multiple roles, including software engineer, lead architect, portfolio manager, trader, and quant analyst, chief data scientist, head of data science, division head for data solutions and services, and as a C-suite executive advisor. Welcome, Kumar. Hi, thank you for having me. How did you evolve into becoming a data scientist? Was it something that you planned for your career? I think it was Niels Bohr that said, forecasting is difficult, especially about the future. A career is rarely fully planned out at the start. Mine wasn't either. I started out wanting to become an engineer and work at Bell Labs in America. That was an aspiration. As a kid in India at the time, this seemed almost unreachable. I worked very hard to get that job and then worked at that job for 11 years before moving on to do other things like finance to expand my horizons and skill set. Along the way, I noticed the field of data was blooming and well, I had the hard technical skills and love math given my engineering background. So I tried it and I haven't looked back since. In the early part of your career, you focused more on architecture and engineering. What role did that play in your development as a data scientist? I was in that first role for 11 years, and it really has been foundational. I worked on many leading edge technologies at Bell Labs Innovations. In the early 2000s, even before smartphones were available and when dial-up internet was still a thing, we were building location-based services and presence technologies. As an aside, 2004 or thereabouts was a tipping point for broadband internet in America. We did a lot of work in designing APIs, helping define standards, building out massively scalable products. Heck, we even worked on what could have been a replacement for Unix and C, a platform called Inferno, developed by the same people that designed Unix and C in the first place. And then there was a lot of work on soft switches and the like. From a business standpoint too, there was a lot of learning for me, conducting sales training, working on M&A and product rationalization, doing competitive intelligence work, etc. I credit the amazing atmosphere at Bell Labs for giving me the hard skills, the critical thinking mindset, the hard-nosed commercial sensitivity, and the never-give-up attitude that I use every day as a data scientist and more generally as a professional to tackle difficult problems and deliver concrete business value wherever I go. They told you two things there on day one. First, leave your ego at home when you come into work. With so many smart people there, it was a really humbling experience. You would have some very strong technical debates and arguments, but you'd stay friends at the end of the day. The second was, be clear on what you know and what you don't know, because otherwise you will never learn. Till today, I'm not afraid of saying I don't know something. I may appear to be a fool for a moment if I ask a question, but the alternative would be for me to be silent and stay a fool forever. Google helps these days, of course, but good learnings regardless. You transitioned from an internet stroke telco company like Bell Laboratories to investment management with Deutsche Bank. How did this transition impact your career? And what were some of the things you had to adapt to as you moved industries? There are many similarities in both roles, far more than meet the eye at first glance. Both require hard skills to do well, a strong business sense and hard work. Both work differently in the quote unquote real world than what you learn in school. There are many differences between the finance you learn in school and what you do as a practitioner, just like there are higher standards in doing engineering professionally than what you would do for a school project. I was fortunate to work with excellent people in both places. I've been lucky that way throughout my career. People who really helped me up my game and made me love going into work every day, building new systems, models, strategies, and platforms, and really make a contribution. But the one thing I think made the biggest difference was to bring that past experience with me into a new domain and apply that knowledge to really move the needle on the business. 
In my career in finance, I've sometimes noticed that I approach problems slightly differently than some of my other colleagues. My background in tech and engineering sometimes lead me, leads me down different pathways that might not immediately seem evident or even accessible to some of the other people. Data science is a relatively new term, but professionals have been working on data science projects in some form or the other for many years. How has the recent focus on data science changed the perception of data scientists in the workplace? Yeah, no kidding. I built models at Bell Labs, models at Deutsche, models in pretty much every job I had. And many models run on data. The field itself is quite old. AI has been around since the 1950s, I think. But three things have come together to cause this recent explosion in data science in the past decade or more. One, data is being created at an exponential pace. Many will tell you more data has been created in the last five years than since the dawn of civilization. Two, we've had massively improved compute and storage capabilities today, with processors including GPUs pushing the limits of physics, and with a cloud that's available relatively cheaply to everyone. And three, we have better algorithms that are continually improving using data and improved compute infrastructure. In the workplace, given the prestige tied to the title, Everyone now wants to claim to be a data scientist. It can be tough getting in, but nice work if you can find it. But the reality is that to excel in this role, one really needs to have the right background, skills, and the willingness to learn, because some of this takes hard work. To make a real difference at any workplace with competent people, one needs to go beyond relying solely on pre-canned libraries to run the load data, train model, and predict commands. Following your stint at Deutsche Bank, you worked for just over a year at a startup. Data scientists usually need certain data infrastructure to be able to be successful at what they do. So what type of challenges did you face in this role and how did you overcome them? At the stealth mode startup that I joined, I was a very early employee, um, employee number three, if I remember correctly. I had to build out the entire analytics infrastructure there from the ground up and worked with the team to deliver data-informed insights to help move the ball forward for the business. That's how I ended up there as the chief data scientist. My experience at Deutsche came in very handy. I had built out the analytics infrastructure for fixed income, currencies, and commodities trading desk there, so was used to rolling up my sleeves and getting busy with Python, R, and data. At a startup, you know you have to do whatever it takes to get the job done. This was a fantastic learning experience for me. Very fulfilling too, given that the startup is now going from strength to strength. You have a track record of success, not just at the workplace, but also through your research with seven US patents registered and one pending. Looking back, what motivated you to go the extra mile to achieve these patents? And how did this journey help you to grow your data science skills? At Bell Labs, doing cutting edge work and then filing for patents was quite routine. I filed my first one with my mentor and my department head as co-inventors within the first few months of my joining. This was related to natural language understanding. After that, thinking of differentiating advantages for the firm and following through with patent applications became quite routine. I know people who have many hundreds of patents to their name, so my contributions are relatively small potatoes in comparison. This keeps you humble when you work with giants in the industry. My then mentor even had an algorithm named after him. I guess in a sense that makes him immortal. In your most recent role in Singapore, you managed a division of about 40 people. Yes, I feel very privileged to have worked in that role. My team did a lot of different things, but almost all data related. It was a great team and good fun too. How would you compare some of the data science talent that you have seen in Singapore with that in the US? Generally speaking, I'd say I've met some very fine data scientists in both places and some not so great ones too. In that way, geog geography doesn't really discriminate. Education now is a global commodity, especially in the post COVID world. The sharpest data scientists are constantly learning, keeping up with the field, improving and trying to do better, and picking up domain expertise as they go. This is independent of geography as well. What are some of the qualities you look for in a data scientist when you hire for your team? 
They say when they test chefs at top-end Italian restaurants, they don't have them make fancy dishes, but just a simple pasta with tomato sauce, and that a skilled evaluator can tell a lot from just this. Similarly, I rely on a simple three-part test. One, I look for a solid understanding of basic math. This is at the high school level, so nothing to sweat. Two, I want to know if the person can code. Pick your favorite programming language and demonstrate to me that you can think clearly about data structures from the ground up and can use data to solve a simple problem. I don't ask for complex computer science algorithms or particular pandas or numpy, numpy functions. So long as your code is not too sloppy, I take a relaxed view of code syntax as well. Three, I ask questions about data science methods and techniques. Again, not difficult ones, but ones that tell me how deeply you think about things and how much you know. That's pretty much it. It is important to test both the range and the depth of the skills the candidate has. These will be key to their long-term success, along with their attitude, of course. They say your aptitude and your attitude together determine your altitude. True in most professional settings, if not also more broadly in life as well. Data scientists are well paid because they bring their very valuable statistical and AI ML toolkit and apply it to various problems, all while studying new domains, gaining expertise, and offering fresh perspective to current experts in the field. Doing this well requires an innate curiosity to explore ideas, to ask questions, source data, and the grit to work through the inevitable disappointments and failures along the way to deliver value to the business. In your opinion, how would you rate how effectively companies in APAC are using their data talent? First, let's look at the talent itself. This varies across the APAC region in various countries. I'm aware China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and India, just to name a few, have large pools of talent. Most of the schools in APAC have a strong focus on quantitative aspects in education, and this positions the students well for the future. What also matters is that aspiring data scientists learn things deeply enough so they can explain things to lay people in very clear terms. This is an art form, and those that master both the hard aspects of science and the soft aspects of communication, presentation, persuasion, negotiation, consensus building, and conflict management, these people will do well regardless of geography. Regarding use of data talent across companies, there is a wide spectrum. At the extremes, some companies hype up AIML so much, it appears like magic and is bound to disappoint. Others have no interest in it at all, think this is all hype, and they risk irrelevance. Companies along the middle path that take a measured view, but pursue projects with talented staff and with some enthusiasm are the ones most likely to be successful. Speaking of talent, it is not enough to merely hire competent data scientists. You need to nurture their skill set, give them growth opportunities, and treat them well, or they will bolt for greener pastures. Our last question for today. Do you have any advice for people who are looking to start their career in or transition their career to data science? To cite an oft-quoted cliche, if you do what everyone does, you'll get what everyone gets. To differentiate, you need to put in the work, learn the details, then build expertise in different domains as you cross verticals. This will make you invaluable. Think of your career as an arc through time. Where you are today, where you want to be, say, five years from now, what skills you'll need for that position, how you will acquire those skills, how you will gain expertise and experience, etc. You need to formulate a plan and then execute it flawlessly. There will of course be periodic setbacks, after all this is life. But you need to be self-driven, motivated, and keep pressing forward. That's the only way to success I know of, though there may be others. I was told early in my career that successful people are T-shaped, depth in one vertical, and broad horizontal skills overall, skills like an MBA gives you. Today I believe the people best positioned in their careers are comb-shaped. You need a good amount of expertise in multiple areas and horizontal skills that span areas. The world is changing. People no longer work in one job their entire careers. For career resilience, to make gainful contributions across industry downturns, you need to be able to work in many industries, a kind of ambidexterity, if you will, that transcends the right and the left. Also, like I said before, education now is a global commodity, especially in the post-COVID world. You can live anywhere and take courses from any school. Many of the best schools make their content available online and at quite reasonable prices. 
on Coursera, edX, or whatever other platform you pick. You can audit courses if you don't want to pay for them and still learn a lot. What really differentiates people now is the will, the hunger to want to do better and be the best that they can be. Two quick examples, if I may. One, the Trevor Hasty Rob Tipshirani lectures from Stanford. They're free and they're on YouTube. They're excellent to learn foundational concepts in data science. Incidentally, they made the PDFs of their books free too on their website. You can Google for them. Two, videos from Caltech's data science class taught by Yasser Abu Mustafa are also freely available for those that want to learn. Great stuff. The world is evolving in other ways too. Growing up, it was considered good to be well-rounded. You focus on your weaknesses and try to eliminate them. Today they say the best people are spiky. You find your strengths, you make them stronger. Try to make your weaknesses irrelevant. Adopt a growth mindset, move forward from there. I try to mine great ideas from books like Mindset by Carol Dweck, Atomic Habits by Jim Clear, Grit by Angela Duckworth, Limitless by Jim Quick, books by Seth Godin, Simon Sinek, Tony Robbins, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, and so on, to keep improving in every way. I think reading widely expands the mind and helps you think laterally, just as useful in solving data problems as it is in living life. Question ideas? Examine your understanding of key concepts. Don't be afraid to explore new directions. Good luck. Thank you, Kumar, for sharing such wonderful insights and advice that I'm sure our audience has enjoyed listening to. For those that tuned in, thank you for joining this fascinating interview and stay tuned for the next edition of Career Stories.